connecting with Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkove. Thank you for watching us and thank you for asking your questions. I will just remind everyone that you can leave your questions on Twitter by using hashtag SWHO in your tweets or if you're watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook or YouTube, please leave your questions in the comments section. Good afternoon, Maria, Mike, how are you today? Good, I'm glad to hear. I know how busy you are every day the whole this year. Um, working uh, tirelessly with scientists and countries around the world uh, and informing the public about our work. Um, one, one piece of work that we, we stress since beginning as part of the public health measures to identify COVID cases and to treat patients is testing. So can we elaborate a little bit more today to our viewers? Um, how and when did we start this work? It was early in the in the outbreak, but just to go back a little in in this uh, work story and also to explain what and how is the best way to use tests in the COVID nineteen response. Sure. So I'll I can start. Um, thanks for having us again, Alex. Um, so testing is just one of the most important things that needs to be done as part of any type of um, preparedness for an event, getting yourself ready for an eventual event, and then once it happens as part of the response. Uh, and for the for COVID-19, um, you know, our global strategy is to suppress transmission and save lives and livelihoods, and that continues to be our, our main focus. And one of the aspects of, of being able to do that is to know where the virus is circulating know who is infected with the virus because that helps us know exactly what actions need to be taken. And so testing, which will identify if somebody is infected with this virus, um, it was critical from the beginning. You know, at first, when you first hear about a cluster of pneumonia of unknown etiology, which means we don't know what it's caused by, um, the first question becomes, you know, is it something new? Is it something we know about? Is it a pathogen or a virus that we know about it? Or is it indeed something new? And in this case, it turned out to be something new. Um, and if we go back to, to January and we think about the timeline of events, um, it's really quite incredible how quickly things happened once we, we became aware of this cluster. Um, you know, within the first nine days, seven to nine days, um, China announced that it was a novel coronavirus on the 9th. Um, a few days later, the full genome sequence, and that's basically the, the, the blueprint of it, you know, what is this virus, was made publicly available, available on websites uh, uh, so that the world could start the development of diagnostic tests. And on the 13th of January, with one of our partner uh, collaborating centers in Germany, uh, Charity, uh, and I apologize if I've said it incorrectly, um, with Christian Drosten and his team, um, who've been collaborators with us for years, we were able to publish the first PCR assay, which is essentially the instructions of how you make a PCR test. Um, that allowed the entire world to start developing tests to find cases. Um, and it's really unprecedented how quickly that happened. I know people say to us, um, you know, was that indeed fast? And in fact, it was. If you actually look back at other outbreaks and other pathogens, it took months, if, if not longer. Um, and so this was really fast. And so WHO very quickly, since after publishing um, that assay, that PCR assay, those instructions, um, we became we started working with companies to say, how can we start the production? How can we start the development of a test? Uh, evaluate that test to make sure that it was performing appropriately, making sure that production started, and meaning how much can, can be made, and then started purchasing and buying and shipping. And by the end of January and early February, we were already shipping um, hundreds of thousands of tests to countries all over the world. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but since then, we've been working with companies all over the world, we've been working with partners, um, and Mike, I, I, it'd be great if you could talk about our, our supply consortium, because we work with so many partners to be able to do this. We've, we're shipping um, millions of diagnostic products all over the world to help countries find cases. Um, and what's really critical is if you know who is a case, then we know what public health actions are necessary to take. So if somebody is infected with this, if they need clinical care, um, you know, they go into this clinical pathway, as we call it, to make sure that they, they get the appropriate uh, type of care. Um, we can carry out what is known as contact tracing. 
So you know, you hear, you hear us say this a lot, find and care for and isolate cases and then carry out contact tracing. So if you know who is infected with this virus, you can talk to that individual and find out who did they come in contact with and then those individuals are put in quarantine. This essentially breaks these chains of transmission and this helps us with that first aspect of our global strategy of suppressing transmission. So it's really, really critical and, and we're just so grateful for so many labs that are working with this. So, we're grateful that countries continue to share these full genome sequences because that's important for us to, to determine if the virus is changing. And there are changes to the virus, but it's still, it hasn't changed enough. Um, these are normal changes with like mutations. Um, the, the, the diagnostics work, um, and there are more and more diagnostics being developed every day. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, Mike, uh, Maria mentioned uh, that there is a consortium of partners we are working on, working with on, de on development and production of uh, tests for COVID-19. Can you explain to our viewers who are we working with and, and what's the way of WHO collaborating with private and public sector in this domain? Yeah, I, I think, well, as we're speaking about diagnostics, I think in the area of diagnostics, is a, it's a really good example. It's, it's not the, certainly not the, by any way the only um, area of collaboration. But if we look at something like a di diagnostics in general, we've got to do the research to find out what, the, as Maria said, a new pathogen, what are the best diagnostics, the different types of diagnostics that have had to be delivered. Then we've got to get manufacturers to work upstream with academics to do the research and then produce them. Then they need to be validated for use. Mm -hmm. Then they need to be pre-qualified to be used by countries. Then we need to have an access framework and we need to be able to get them to countries at a price that people can afford. And then we have to train the health workers and the people on the front line to be able to use those tests properly. Uh, so it's a whole chain of activities and it has to be connected. And no one institution has all of the capacities along that chain to make that happen. Um, so what we did uh, at the beginning uh, was really come together across three really important parts of the supply chain globally, because the supply chain was broken. When we cast our minds back to February, March, the whole world shut down, the airlines shut down, nothing could be moved, factories were empty, uh, universities were empty. Uh, a lot of what we consider normal life had, had stopped. We couldn't stop. We needed diagnostics. We needed to produce them at scale. We needed to get them to countries. So, and that was the same for medical oxygen. That was the same for medical equipment and ventilators. That was the same for, for personal protective equipment. So there were many, many areas. But if we take the diagnostics as that area, who do we, we reached out uh, through the uh, UN supply chain platform that we created with the World Food Program with UNICEF and so many others, reached out to other partners, each partner playing its part. Uh, we worked with the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, FIND, uh, who did a lot of work in exploring and validating which producers could produce new diagnostics at a certain quality. We worked with CHAI, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, that worked with us and the Global Fund on developing a, a, a diagnostics consortium where we had a group working on procuring this stuff, finding it, a group working on how to pay for it. The Gates Foundation and others provided purchase guarantees that allowed us to do it advanced purchasing uh, while we were waiting for donor funds to arrive. I know that sounds like a small thing, but that's a big thing mm -hmm. because it meant we could go and buy this stuff. Um, uh, and then we had a group working on allocation models to see, to estimate what did countries actually need and also to see if they had the lab technicians and the trained people to use the tests if they set, were sent there. Did they have the reagents? Uh, did they have the transport media? So it wasn't just sending the test. There's a whole amount of infrastructure and again working downstream with lots of different agencies. So this required a huge collaboration between many different types of entities, public, private, academic, NGOs, UN, to come together to fix a problem. Um, and I think a huge amount has been done. That's now evolved. The Diagnostics Consortium are of the of the, the supply chain platform is now evolving into becoming the diagnostics consortium of the ACT accelerator. In other words, a further acceleration. We were getting up to millions and millions of tests. The ACT accelerator is now going to try and get to like 20, 30, 40 million tests a month going out to countries. That will be dependent not only on the existing PCR tests, but on other tests like antigen tests and others. So 
uh, we're working very closely within that consortium uh, of the ACT Accelerator to further scale up access to testing. And that takes it to another level. Uh, and in that, we thank our colleagues uh, at UNITAID, at the Global Fund, at the Gates Foundation, and again, those same partners working to further accelerate the activity. So, you know, uh, WHO sits at in a sense, in a, in a privileged position to be able to bring together and leverage and to, to bring those combinations together. But it's the agencies and, and those institutions, all the way from that academic unit that develops that interesting new test down to that frontline trainer who's training lab techs how to use it. Each and every one of those individuals is vital. Uh, our job is to ensure that they have the knowledge and the resources and the platforms to be able to do that. Uh, and we're still learning. We're not there. It's not perfect by any means. Uh, but I, I believe uh, it's been an excellent collaboration overall. Yes. Thank you very much, Mike. You also mentioned in this long process that there is validation and pre-qualification so that the quality fulfills certain level of criteria, uh, quality criteria to be used. Does WHO play any role in uh, validating or pre-qualifying diagnostics? And if yes, what's the role that WHO plays that we can now explain? Yeah, we, we, we won't go into uh, uh, terrible detail on this. But there's, there's a huge function in WHO for pre-qualification in general, and Mariangela Samao and Emer Cook and others uh, do a fantastic job with their teams. And this is a service that's provided to the world, not just during epidemics, but for in between it for all kinds of drugs and diagnostics. And what pre-qualification does, and there are differences here between licensing and pre I don't know, I'll explain it because people get confused. Right? Uh, countries license products. So if a country wants to use a product, a medical product, a drug, an antibiotic, a vaccine, it can license that product for use in its country. And many countries have very strong regulatory authorities who have the resources to be able to do the, the oversight to do that licensing. Many countries, though, don't necessarily have that same firepower. And what they will tend to do is they'll look at a new licensed product and then they'll ask that WHO pre-qualifies that product. In other words, the WHO ensures that the licensing process, the research, the data, the production capacity is safe and efficacious. And in some senses, then WHO puts a stamp to say, this producer of this product is pre-qualified to sell through WHO on the international market. And that gives assurance to countries that they're not only buying a safe and efficacious product, but one that's been properly manufactured uh, and they can then use with a high degree of assurance. That allows their regulatory authorities to accept these products more easily. Um, and uh, it's a huge service, and it's hugely important in this pandemic, but it, you can't understate the value of that to our member states over the last 40 or 50 years. It's, it's hugely important. And in the same vein for diagnostics and for other products this time around, vaccines will have the same issues. There are um, other mechanisms short of pre-qualification where WHO and other national authorities can issue emergency listings and others to bring products to the market more quickly, but there are stringent criteria for that. We won't get into that today, uh, but there are uh, emergency mechanisms to do that, but again, they're, they're subject to very strict criteria and very strict data requirements. Uh, but again, hats off to those teams, because these are the unsung heroes of WHO, because the work they do to ensure that uh, medical products are not only safe and efficacious, but that countries can rely on them in terms of their production processes is, is, is a huge service, uh, and one we're grateful for too, because we're in the front line and we need those products, so these are the real heroes uh, in my view. Kind of, I can just say we have to remember that in a pandemic the whole world is at risk and you need this production very, very fast and you need a huge volume of tests to be able to be used. And so it's very different when you have a localized outbreak of something that you know may, may cause an outbreak in one part of one country. This is all countries needing something and needing access to it really, really quickly. And one of the positives of this is because the sequence was shared so quickly and because so many companies and so many groups are developing these products, it means there are literally hundreds of products on the market. And the, it's really confusing um, to know which one should I use, where do they work best, and do they actually perform as well as they claim on the box, you know? And so the service that, that Mike has described through our pre-qualification and through that whole process is incredibly important to know which ones you can rely on, which ones are more reliable. And I think that's really, really important because just having a test done, if it's not a quality test, 
then you don't know if you are actually infected and you don't know for certain. And that's really what's important. And somebody walking around in their country wanting to know if they're infected, they're going to want to know if I got that test, how reliable is that? And so there's a process behind that. And so countries and governments are purchasing these tests to make sure that these are high quality products. Thank you very much. I think it was really important to explain this process and that we do play a role in ensuring that safe and quality products, and in this case tests, are on the ground and that countries are using. Because several viewers, not only during this slide, but before were asking, how do we know the tests are safe? Who is, who is ensuring the quality, uh, can we, et cetera? Can we say something on that, though? Because they're not perfect, like, like we should say. I mean, even if you have high quality products, they're not always perfect. And it, and it does depend not just on the test itself. It depends on how the sample is collected. Make sure that, you know, for a respiratory pathogen, you normally, and if anybody's had a test um, for this, you know, there's a, there's a little tiny, almost looks like a Q-tip. It's not a Q-tip, but it goes up your nose and it goes pretty far back. It doesn't hurt. I've had the test a couple of times. Um, it doesn't hurt, but it's a little awkward. And so um, just so people, people are aware of that. But all of those products also are important, uh, just as important as the test itself, you know, to make sure you have all of the right supplies in addition to the actual test itself, making sure the right sample is collected, making sure that it's stored appropriately, that the test is run properly, and really, really critically, that the result gets back quickly. And so one of the critical things that we're, we're focused on is making sure that not only tests are being used appropriately, but that results are coming back quickly. So some tests can come back within hours, some take 24 hours, but again, if you get a test and you don't hear back for a week or so, that's that, that Too it's, late. it's late, yes. I think so, I think, um, well, I think it might be a good idea Alex, at some point in the next few weeks to, to invite in our colleagues from uh, Double Fund and Find and our, our lab team maybe have a bit more of a deep dive on this because it's a, it's, a, it's a hugely important area and really and truly it's it's not just WHO there there's mm -hmm. so many others who've made this actually work mm -hmm. uh, but just following on Maria's point uh, maybe we will talk about this later in the interview it's it's not just about the number of tests sometimes we get caught up on the number of tests it's like anything you have in life it's not the quantity it's the quality and it's how you use those tests uh, these are assets you have. These are cards you play in the game and it's like poker, it depends how you play your hand. And in that sense when you have tests you can play your hand one way and lose, you can play your hand slightly differently and win. And countries that have been successful have used their testing regimes very effectively because they think their way through the process. They've thought their way through why are we using testing, when are we using testing, who are we going to test, how are we going to make the testing process really efficient so the results get back quickly. So we can use testing as part of our control strategy rather than testing as part of a defense strategy to say we're testing loads of people. It doesn't matter if it's not impacting on disease control. If it's not getting people into clinical care quickly, it's just a number. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just becomes a dot on a graph. Uh, it's meaningless. It's not the number of tests. It's how and where and when they're used. How effectively is testing used as part of a comprehensive strategy? The countries that have got that right have got the pandemic response right, I, I think. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. A few questions are coming from our viewers. One is, how often do we need to take a test? And the second one is, is mass PCR testing really necessary? Is it useful for asymptomatic cases? That's a really good question. They're both really good questions Careful, related. Right? We could. <laughs> how, how, long, how long do you have, Alex? No, I think, I mean, our, our recommendations for testing are to really focus on your suspect cases. And there's definitions for this because when you have to prioritize, and in situations where you really need to prioritize, that's who you prioritize. And there's a reason for that. It's because these, we believe that these individuals are more likely to be infected. Some of it has to do with symptoms. Some of it has to do with your contact with a known case. Um, and use those tests really appropriately. Um, you've heard us say many times this outbreak, this virus operates in clusters. And so what that means is that there are outbreaks that happen. And when countries identify where transmission is occurring, what they normally do is they do what we call an outbreak investigation. Using your tests wisely in an outbreak investigation for your known cases, testing your contacts, the higher risk contacts, can really be helpful to bring those outbreaks under control. But it needs to be strategic. Um, in situations where, so not all countries are in the same transmission intensity. So we've, we've outlined some guidance around when and where testing can be used. When you have few cases or 
clusters of cases, you can really target your suspect cases in your outbreak investigation. When you're in a situation of community transmission and it's incredibly intense, you may need to prioritize. So we make some recommendations on who to prioritize. This is focusing on your suspect cases, it's focusing on your frontline workers, it's focusing on those who are most vulnerable to really you know, use them the most appropriately. So somebody out there walking around and saying, do I need a test? There's, you would need a test if you developed symptoms, if you, if you had contact with a known case and you become a contact. But I should say, if you are a case, you should be in isolation. If you have symptoms, you should be, any symptoms, you should be at home and call your medical provider, please. If you are a contact of a known case, you should be in quarantine. And all of that is important, and testing is a part of, it's one part of the strategy. It's not the only part of the strategy. So our recommendation is really to be strategic. Focus on your suspect cases, suspected cases, um, so that you know where the virus is and you know where the virus isn't. Uh, oh. <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> so, the next question is from our LinkedIn viewer. Uh, what is the sensitivity and specificity of the peer test? That's a good question. I need tables in front of me. It, it depends. Uh, it depends on the test that is used. Um, so if we're talking about molecular tests or, or antigen-based tests, it depends when they are used. The ones that are highly qualified have a very high sensitivity and specificity. And that means when we test someone we, and, and they test positive, we know that it's a true positive, and vice versa. Yeah. If we test them negative, we know that they're a true negative. So it varies. It's a very difficult question to, to answer without knowing which specific test we're talking about. But the aim is to have very high, you know, 95, 98, 99% sensitivity and specificity. Uh, but it will vary by the test itself. Thank you. Uh, the yeah. Again, it's not, the, the test has some inherent parameters of sensitivity and specificity. And then there are, I won't go into explanations like I tried before. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's important to understand that even with those performance um, parameters for the test, the test performs differently in different situations of transmission. So a test will be more or less predictive depending on whether the transmission in the community is high in intensity or not. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's important to remember that because we also have to check when the companies submit their data. We have to understand what was the context, what was the what do we assume was the background prevalence of disease? Because that ultimately affects the performance of the test in reality. So there's a difference between the performance of the test in the lab yes. and the actual performance of the test as a public health predictor. In other words, predicting do you have SARS or not. The likelihood that it's successful in doing that can often depend on uh, tests do better when there's lots of virus around, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And when there's not lots of virus around, tests are more difficult to interpret. So, th so it's really tough, and that's why it's hard to give these uh, these absolute uh, figures. We, we can give you an example, right? Mm -hmm. So there are Please. these new tests that are coming online. These are called antigen-based tests, and they basically detect the proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus if, if somebody is infected with this. So these antigen-based RDTs, there's a lot of them on the market. Some perform better than others. And one of the, essentially, and I'm overgeneralizing here, but essentially they work, they perform better um, they have a higher predictive value, as uh, Mike was saying, when there is more virus circulating in the community and when an individual is most infectious. They have the highest viral load. And for a SARS-CoV-2 infected person, that's two days before they develop symptoms mm -hmm. and up to five, seven days after they develop symptoms. That's when we believe people are most infectious. So two days before symptom onset, up to five, seven days after they develop their illness. And so if you use an antigen-based test during that time period, you have a higher likelihood of, 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 of capturing them being positive. The PCR tests are more sensitive and specific. They operate better, and, 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 and that's why people focus on those. But these new RDTs coming online are going to be incredibly helpful as well in specific situation where there's lots of virus around. They can help in these types of outbreak investigations that I described. Um, so there's lots of different ways in which they can be useful in helping us control yes. spread. And there are practical issues with uh, testing as well, because a test can be very, very accurate, but if it has to be done in a central lab yeah. with a highly qualified technician and you've got to move samples hundreds of miles and have a very specialized machine and a very highly trained technician, you might get very high quality results, but you don't do a lot of tests. Uh, so the more we can push testing towards the community, 
towards the person, yeah. the better. So yeah. there are, and again, this is the issue of, of the difference between uh, the science and the policy and the practicalities right. of actually implementing public health science. There's a translational process, and as you translate results out of the laboratory uh, and into the, the reality of the world, you have to then look at other things, like how much training am I going to need? So if I have a rapid diagnostic test available that requires very little training to apply that test, then I'm going to be very positive about that, but I'll still be aware that that test is not as good, maybe, as a PCR test. But that may be acceptable if I'm living in a low-income country and I have very little lab infrastructure and I have very few lab trained lab technicians. Once I understand the performance of the test, I'm able to use, it's a bit like having that uh, uh, insight. Once, one, once I recognize that the test I have isn't perfect and I know how imperfect it is, I can still use that test as long as I recognize the imperfections because I'm gaining the advantage of uh, being able to do more tests. And it's holding those two things in balance and finding a way to make the best public health application of a new tool. And we don't do enough implementation research. We tend to focus our investments upstream, which is great, to get the new products. But we need to make sure that those products can be used effectively. And a lot of that comes down to simple stuff like logistics and cold chain and train tech. I know it sounds terribly boring, but I've seen more public health projects fail, not because of the upstream science, but because of the downstream barriers. Um, uh, hesitancy, access, uh, logistics, uh, you know, the simple existence of a refrigerator to be able to refrigerate uh, tests or to refrigerate uh, uh, samples. So uh, that's where I think we can make even more progress. And I hope one of the legacies that we will see in the aftermath of COVID-19 is that we really will see the value of things like that, the value of the health system as a system that can deliver this kind of thing uh, and that we can rebuild our health systems to make them more agile, make them more responsive to events like this, make them more capable of dealing with an expansion of workload. And it's one of the things we've done over the years. We've chopped our health systems down to the bare minimum. Uh, they have very little capacity to expand and react to an emergency. They've become quite static and rigid, not elastic and expandable. And we need a health system that can adapt and react uh, and then use new technologies quickly. And it's, all of those things need to come together. So it's not just about the tests. And sometimes we get caught up on the test. Uh, it's how we use the test uh, is the key thing. I think this is a good opportunity also to mention how we've leveraged existing systems for COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, so in, in December, um, we didn't know, you know, in, in January, in February, in March, in April, what the whole world did is they harnessed and leveraged the global influenza network and the national influenza centers that exist in so many countries across the world. This is, this is the global influenza uh, network, uh, response, surveillance and response network, excuse me, GISRIS, has been in operation for 70 years. And that is a system that has trained technicians, it has equipment, it has this whole process of electricity and, and reporting mechanisms and individuals who could quickly utilize that experience that they have for influenza for COVID, for SARS-CoV-2. And that, that made us operate even quicker. And so how can we use this pandemic to actually further that, further these systems that are in place so that for the next time we can be even faster? And so we still need, and I also am going to use this opportunity to say we still need to be testing for flu. Hmm. You know, so most of the flu labs were quickly adapted for COVID and, and stopped testing for, for flu. And now we're finding the right balance between the two because these are viruses that circulate, flu circulates the globe. And as we enter the winter, um, we've just hit autumn uh, in the northern hemisphere. And as influenza starts to circulate, we need all of the labs to be able to test for influenza and for COVID so that we make sure we know what's circulating, we know what people have, because there are different clinical pathways, and so we need to, you know, again, it's all about the action. A test is one thing, but then what does it mean? What do we do? Um, and there are very good systems in place, so we're really grateful for the entire global influenza network um, that is working so hard and has so many incredibly trained in, uh, individuals all over the world. Thank you very much, Maria. One of our viewers is saying, uh, if PCR test is not accurate, is there any new test to check out for COVID-19? You did mention there are new rapid tests. Maybe we can also explain to viewers how many different type of tests are there and what do they measure? 
Let me correct something first, though, because we see that the part of the question was PCR are not accurate. PCR tests are accurate. Very, very PCR accurate. tests are very, very accurate. They are highly credible. That is what is being used globally. So um, please let's clarify that. Thanks. What we were trying to highlight were uh, the number of ways in which they can be used and how they should be used. But please be sure PCR tests are accurate. Um, there are different types of tests. So the PCR tests are, are looking for the RNA, the, these, part, these pieces of the virus that you are infected with. Um, and there's lots of PCR assays that are available. And as Mike was describing, part of the goal of the consortium in, uh, of WHO was to make sure that the right tests went to the right countries to utilize the machines that were in country. I don't, I don't, I was amazed by this because it isn't just about we have 100 million tests or 26 million tests or whatever it is. It's about getting the right test to the right technician in the right lab in that country um, with all the supplies that are necessary for that and the right reagents and the right so it's an incredible match work that's that's great so there's the PCR tests these are being widely used these are highly accurate and we rely on these globally um, and you can get a test back from PCR within hours um, the difficulty in getting those tests back sometimes is where the sample is collected, if the sample itself needs to be uh, transported by car or by drone, we've even seen in some situations, to a centralized lab, have the test run and have the test back. That sometimes can take hours to days. Um, there are these antigen-based uh, rapid diagnostic tests, and these detect the proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in an individual. These are done, as they say, rapidly where you can get results back within, um, within minutes, within 15 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. And essentially, you take a sample, you put it in, in the, the, the test tube, and then a little drop of that goes onto this strip that looks almost like a pregnancy test. You know, and, and it moves up and it tells you if, you, if, you're, if you're positive or not. Those, there are a number of those that are online. Um, some perform better than others. But as those get rolled out, as that performance improves, um, this will be very, very helpful. But these antigen-based RDTs, we outlined guidance, we released guidance about the use of antigen-based RDTs last week, I believe. Um, feels like a long time ago, but I think it was last week when we, when we released this. But we recommend these antigen-based RDTs to be used in four different situations. The first is to re respond to suspect outbreak in, in remote areas where you don't have PCR testing. So in a remote setting, in institutions, or semi-closed communities. The second one is to support outbreak investigations, which I described earlier, where you, where you have at least one PCR positive case. This will help you understand the extent of that outbreak. You could test your contacts, including asymptomatic uh, close contacts, uh, and it'll help you understand who's at risk and who is infected. The third is to monitor trends and incidents in specific higher risk populations, like frontline workers, for example. And again, they will work better where you, in, in settings where you have more virus circulating. And then the fourth area is in areas of community transmission. And so those types of areas will really, antigen-based RDTs will be very helpful to use and will take the pressure off the PCR systems that are in place. Um, so these are the two main tests that look for active infection. Am I infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus now? There's a third type of test, which are the serologic-based tests. These will me measure the levels of antibodies in an individual. And antibodies develop after one, two, three weeks after infection, sometimes longer, and will tell you if you had been infected in the past. We don't recommend those for active case finding, but those help us understand the extent of infection that had circulated in the population. And that helps us understand, you know, how much room does this virus have to spread? You want to add? No. Okay. <laughs> there, 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 is a, there is a follow up question from our Facebook viewer. Yeah. Why are there so many tests for COVID 19? Oh. Why are there so many different tests, or why are there so many tests available? Uh, different tests. Because they measure different things. And they're all helping us to really, again, reach this goal of suppressing transmission and saving lives. The fact that we have the market almost flooded with these tests is a positive thing. It, there's innovation that is happening. Um, we talked about two types of tests, but there's all the other types of tests that are out there that are being explored. And it's really pushing the boundaries of what we can do. And I think that that should be celebrated. Um, there does need to be this proper evaluation so we know how well they work. And there's processes in place that, that do that. Um, but I think that it's, this is a good thing. 
I think this is a really good thing. And we're always looking for new technologies, and we're looking for new advances to be able to have quicker, more rapid tests close to the patient. We call these point-of-care tests. Um, so if someone, if you're in a hospital bed or you show up at a primary care clinic somewhere and you need a test, how quickly can we get that result back to you? But there is a, I think in future, I mean, it's happening already, and I think the, there is this emergence of what we call multiplex testing, the ability to use the same platform for diagnosing multiple different yeah. uh, infectious diseases. And I think we are reaching a point, and I think somehow on the, on, on the lab side, <laughs> if you remember, cast your mind back to the 50s and 60s, those of you who can remember that far back, um, you know, when big companies were asked, you know, how many computers would the world need, it was like less than 100 now, uh, when we looked at telecommunications infrastructure around the world and people wondered how developing countries were going to develop all of the telecommunications infrastructure, and mobile phones came along, and countries have leapfrogged the need to develop all of that heavy infrastructure by having a much lighter infrastructure that does the same job. I think we're seeing the same ultimately in laboratory science. In the old days, we saw the big public health laboratories, the National Public Health Lab, and, and there was a lot of investment in bricks and mortar and labs and walls and uh, things. And it was very much a, it was almost like one of those magical scientists where you had to be hugely qualified and it was a, you know, it was kind of a mystical thing how lab people made diagnosis. And, and to be quite frank, some of my laboratory colleagues are some of the most clever, innovative, creative people I've ever met. But I think we're seeing much more so now, This, with the fourth industrial revolution, with miniaturization the same way as we've seen with the computers, uh, we're seeing a revolution in how we make diagnosis. And we're seeing platforms emerge that can diagnose, at the same time, 90 different infections simultaneously. Um, and I think we're going to see a brand new era. And I think maybe if the the, the COVID pandemic has... I think generated its own momentum to solve the COVID diagnostics problem, but I think it's also going to drive a new era of innovation in laboratory science and in diagnostic platforms. And I think we're going to see a lot more miniaturization, we're going to see a lot more multi-diagnostics, we're going to see diagnosis move closer to the patient, more into the hands of the clinician and the nurse and the doctor, the things we want to see. Uh, and, I, and I'm hopeful that that's the direction we're going. So it does seem confusing when you, you, know, you open up a newspaper and there's 70 different companies producing 200 different tests. It's confusing for us at times as well, I can assure you. <laughs> so I can really understand where the listener is coming from. Um, but I think Maria is right. We need the innovation now. But we also need to move to a, a more um, multi-diagnostic -diagnost platform where we don't just have to keep climbing the same hill of diagnostics every time we have an epidemic. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to, to collect a sample and put it in a machine and that machine come out and say, there's all these different things. You've got I mean, this it's, or you've that. got this or that. I mean, we don't, we don't have that we don't, yet. We don't, we don't have that yet. And I think that's why in the beginning when you have um, an emerging pathogen like SARS-CoV-2, when you don't know in the beginning, what labs will do is they'll take, they'll take a sample from a patient who's sick, and it's normally they show up in, in hospital, and this is the situation that happened in China. They identified patients with pneumonia um, of unknown etiology, and that means they didn't know what it was because when you run it through the lab, you run it for influenza and SARS and MERS and for all of your known pathogens. And then once you exhaust that, you know, you say, okay, what is that? Um, and so we're getting quicker at being able to do this, and full genome sequencing is helping tremendously push that. But we're also seeing innovation-wise of looking at saliva-based testing. You know, how can we take different types of samples? Think about kids and sampling children, and if you need to take blood versus you need to get a nasal swab versus if they could just spit into a cup. So there's lots of different practical things that can help diagnostics move faster. Um, and so all of that innovation is happening. Um, and so, yeah, we're just, it's, it's pushing it. And each one of these events, because this will not be the last pandemic, and it will not be the last emerging pathogen, but we're in, each time we're in a better situation. But let's see how we use this as a, as a way to drive this even further and, and faster. There are some questions coming um, about the isolation and discharging from, uh, after having COVID-19. What are the recommendation? Is it repeated, repeating tests? But I want to read this one in particular. Okay. Um, some countries still require two negative tests to de-isolate COVID-19 patients if they are baseline immunocompromised or HIV or, or on chemotherapy treatment. Is there any evidence to support this approach? 
So that's a really excellent question, a very specific one. So WHO, um, what we do is we work with our lab partners, we work with clinicians, we work with epidemiologists to really understand patients and we understand when someone is infectious. So what we understand from the data that is available and to do this well, you need to follow the same patient over time and collect repeat samples from those individuals. You need to do that from asymptomatic cases, mild, moderate, severe cases. So we really understand, is it the same depending on your disease? What we understand for um, and what our isolation, discharge isolation criteria is based upon is that type of data. What WHO recommends, we, recommends is initially in the beginning of the pandemic, we recommended two negative tests at least 24 hours apart. Um, when you have a pandemic that has at least 31 million known cases, and there may be more that are currently unrecognized, testing becomes challenging. So we were asked um, to look at the data and to try to come up with uh, non-test-based discharge criteria. And when I say discharge, I don't mean discharge from hospital. I mean discharge from these isolation, proce isolation uh, procedures because they're no longer infectious. So for an asymptomatic individual, so this is somebody who tested positive once for a PCR test, our recommendation is 10 days isolation, and then they can be discharged from isolation. For a symptomatic patient, what we recommend is 10 days from symptom onset plus an additional three days after their symptoms get better, their symptoms resolve, meaning they don't have fever and they don't have respiratory symptoms. Now, countries can continue to use testing as part of their discharge criteria because some individuals may be uh, test positive for longer. But what we know from PCR testing is that the PCR test itself will measure parts of the virus itself. It doesn't tell you if there's live virus that's replicating and that they're infectious. What we need for that is to do what's called virus isolation, where you take the sample and you, you try to grow it in a lab and see if it can grow. And that means that it's replicating and that it's infectious. So that's what the isolation criteria is on. And we know for immunocompromised individuals, they can test positive PCR positive for, for long periods of time. And so some countries will still require that two negative tests. So we give the option. We wanted to give options to, to all uh, um, of our member states to be able to say, if you don't use testing, this is the criteria. We have this online. We have an infographic, which we could provide that, that makes it a little bit easier to follow. Um, but that's, that's where we're coming from. And we constantly look at the data. Um, and we constantly are looking at um, you know, what, what is new. The reason we have this for symptomatic patients, the 10 days <clears throat> from symptom onset plus three days of symptom resolution is because we know that severe patients can shed virus, live virus, longer. Um, and so we want to just ensure that, and those, those individuals are hospitalized, so they're already in isolation. Um, so it's a long answer, but it's because it, it's based on a lot of different criteria. Yeah, and I think it may be a useful idea, and thank you for the, the prompt on this, listener, because I do think the, the concept of immunocompromise is very broad. Yeah. We have many people living with HIV who are on therapy, and they're perfectly, perfectly well. They're not mm -hmm. immunocompromised in that sense. Uh, there are many people equally with different levels of, of autoimmune disease who may or may not be in very compromised depending on what stage the disease is at or, you know. So I do think it may be useful for us, Maria, to, to bring together a group and look specifically at this group mm -hmm. in terms of that evidence you speak about so we can give better guidance to countries because <clears throat> we don't want to be in a position necessarily where people are being held in hospital or being told to self-isolate for longer than they need to. Uh, it's tough enough to live with the disease uh, that, oh, associated with immunocompromise than to be further isolated more than you need to be. Uh, so uh, I do think it's worth us taking Absolutely. a look at that again uh, and that specific thing. And we, and we, we <clears throat> hope our collaborating centers and our labs that are able to carry out this type of research are doing so because you really need good data. You don't need this type of study in you know, 100 countries or even 10 countries. We need a well done, well characterized, uh, well conducted study following individuals, taking repeat samples and providing that data. So we work with a, lab, with, with a group of uh, an in, entire international network of laboratorians and clinicians. And so, yes, this is something we, we will continue to look at. I thank you very much. I think with this answer, you covered a lot of other questions that we've been okay. receiving. But before we close, I just want to reflect on serological tests because yeah. we've received a lot of interest over days on this. What have we learned so far from serological studies about immunity recovery, about antibodies, about the reinfection? So these are the 
frequently asked questions on our social media and would be good if you can explain maybe once again what we know so far. Sure. So I'll, I, it's, it is my favorite question. It, it's my favorite question because I am very, very um, passionate about these serologic studies because we, as a global community, have recognized the importance of these types of studies in these emerging pathogens. And you know, t 11 years ago, 15 years ago, when we were talking about H5N1, which is an avian influenza, and it's rarely circulated and it just spills over and we had no idea the extent of this infection. And there were all these studies that were being done, and they were done differently. There was different methods used, there were different tests used, there were different populations used. And to be able to compare a, a study and a study, it was like comparing apples and oranges, and we just couldn't do it. And so this group came together, CONCISE, a consortium, it's not a CONCISE acronym, the Consortium for the Standardization of Influenza Seroepidemiology. To, <laughs> I know. I apologize, but it's called Concise, and it had an epi working group and a laboratory working group. And the epi group, we had hundreds of scientists all over the world that were developing uh, protocols, study protocols, templates to say, if you're going to do this type of study, please follow this methodology in your country, adapt it as necessary, but follow this methodology so that we can compare results. And then there was a lab group that was quickly developing the assays. What are the tests that can be used? We've used that for influenza, we've used it for Zika, we've used it for MERS, we're using it for COVID-19. And right now, there are countries all over the world that are carrying out these seroepidemiology studies. These studies measure the antibody response that somebody has after infection. When someone is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they develop antibodies. And what we're learning about this is how strong this antibody response is and for how long it lasts. I'm going to overgeneralize because there are literally hundreds of studies. I was trying to look at the database uh, before we came in here because I knew this was going to come up. And it's very difficult to summarize succinctly, and I'm not being very succinct. I apologize. What we're learning from these literally hundreds of studies that are ongoing is that when we look at the general population, um, around 5 to 10 percent of those that are sampled have, example, have evidence of antibodies. Um, in some studies that focus on health workers or frontline workers or people who are more exposed, the seroprevalence, we call it, these are the results, are a little bit higher. It can go up to 20 percent, 25 percent. In some settings, in slums, in some countries, we've seen higher seroprevalence of maybe 40, 45 percent. Um, but when you look at this collectively, the, again, overgeneralizing, less than 10 percent of the world's population has evidence of infection overgeneralization. So that tells us nine months into a pandemic that the majority of the world remains susceptible. And so that's really critical. That means we still have to continue to put all of these actions in place to prevent transmission. Now the, the, the gold standard type of study is what we call a longitudinal study, which follows the same individuals over time. And your question about how long is somebody protected comes from those types of studies. And there are a few of those that are not hundreds. There's less than five or six that I'm aware of right now of the longitudinal studies. And they're following the same individual over time and looking at those antibodies. And in some of those studies, the antibody levels stay relatively the same. And in some, they, they reduce a little bit. So we don't know. We don't know how long those antibodies will last. We don't know how long protection will last. Um, so that's why it's important that we continue to do all of these measures in place. We have experience with other coronaviruses, the common cold coronaviruses, the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, MERS um, and we know that antibodies don't last forever. So we do know that over time for those viruses. Um, and so that may be happening with the SARS-CoV-2 virus as well. You, there may be a point in time where antibodies start to wane. I don't want to scare anybody, but it's just these are the things that we're looking at. Um, but also waning antibodies doesn't necessarily mean you're fully susceptible to the virus Correct. again. Because the, the, the immune, immune system loses the, the, the amount of antibody in the blood, but it doesn't mean it loses the immunologic memory. It just may take it longer to react. And we have many situations where even at a long range, you may get the disease again, but you may have a less severe infection. So and we don't know that either, but you know, we can say you're going to get a new infection and it's going to be just as bad as the last time, better or worse. We would expect, I think, that uh, that uh, having a natural infection results in uh, immunity for a period of time that we cannot determine absolutely, but will give you protection over uh, that period. Right. Uh, and what these longitudinal studies 
uh, will determine that. So if you're asked to be part of one of those studies, and we can say we're, we volunteered to be part of the yes, Swiss one, so we we're did. going to get bled yeah. every month or yeah. whatever it is for the next number of months, not for ourselves, but to add to the body of knowledge. So we give our blood to contribute to that. If you are asked to be part of a longitudinal study, please do, because that kind of information over time is, is really vital. Mm -hmm. Getting repeated information from the same individuals from within a community is really, that's the highest it's value it's information, it's a gold standard. Yeah. So please participate if you're asked, uh, try to help, uh, because that will help countries, will help us uh, determine that over the, uh, but please people, I think it's, it's, it's important because everyone is getting a little concerned, vaccine seems a little further away than it was before, the disease is, is, is on the rise again in the northern hemisphere, people are worried about the influenza season at the same time and now the antibodies may not protect us and it may seem like doomsday. So we, we, we do need to balance this mm -hmm. uh, with the fact that it is <clears throat> been, it's really clear that if, if governments work with communities to apply comprehensive measures. If communities and individuals take their own actions to avoid risk as much as possible, uh, if we r rely on our health system to be able to treat those that are sick, and, and, and much has been learned about how better to treat people, uh, that we're better at this now. And we shouldn't just accept that we're going into another round of transmission and things are going to get even worse. We've learned lessons, and not only on the um, epidemic control side, but also on the economic management side. So governments now have <coughs> to work with communities to find a really fine balance now between controlling transmission of this disease, preventing mortality from this disease, and then sustaining our society and, econo and economy through keeping schools open and prioritizing the most vital aspects of social and economic life while preserving the lives of potential, very often those who are older and our wisest and most cherished citizens uh, while trying to control transmission and everybody else. And again, I would say to younger people in this, you're not, you're not immune from this disease. And while it may not be as severe a disease, again, I, say, I, I mentioned previously studies in Germany that looked at cardiac changes in, in people who have moderate disease. I see some very uh, recent information from a Swiss study that looked at people who had mi mild and moderate symptoms, not admitted to hospital, younger people. And those of you involved in sport will know about VO2, and the, the, the athletes will know this, and I know a lot of kids involved in sport. Your ability or your, your maximum capacity to process oxygen uh, is a big measure that's used in sport. We've seen with symptomatic individuals, uh, you know, that people, 19%, uh, I think, in the Swiss study, of those symptomatic individuals, not not severe symptoms, younger people, mild to moderate symptoms, 19% of them had more than a 10% drop uh, in VO2 in, in the convalescent period. They're not processing oxygen as well as they were before they were infected. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. That's not a good thing, right? So I said before about people finding us difficult to recover. That's probably one of the reasons why people are finding it difficult to recover, is that your lungs may not process oxygen into your blood as efficiently as they did before, and we don't know how long that will take to recover. So we wish everyone the mildest possible infection if, if they are infected, but please don't assume that this is an infection without consequence. Uh, it may not have a consequence of death uh, for you, but it may have that consequence for an older person. But it will, as we see more and more with long haulers and, and other people who are suffering long-term effects, it does have consequences for us all. And I just think we need to take that into account. But speaking today, there's so much more we can do. We can diagnose this thing more quickly and better than we ever did before. We can get people into care more quickly and better than we've ever done before. Our doctors and nurses are more skilled and better equipped than they have been before. We've got... Uh, uh, therapeutics like dexamethasone that help rescue very severe patients. We've got vaccines coming down the pipe and uh, we really do then need to focus to work together to make sure that we uh, we get through this next couple of months and uh, and so I don't want people to walk away from this thinking, oh, <laughs> sky's going to fall in. It's, 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 it's not. We're going to get through this. Uh, we just need to intensify the way we work together. 
uh, scientifically, as communities, uh, as health workers, and, and I believe we will. So it's a message of hope, but we have to be realistic at the same time. But sometimes we're a bit over-realistic here and we tend to speak the science, and I think sometimes that can scare people. Me. If I could say something on that, if, if, if our, your viewers, our viewers only hear one thing today, they need to know that there are things that they can do to protect themselves right now. And you hear us say us, if you watch us at all at any of these pressers, we are a broken record. We will continue to say this consistently and as clearly as hopefully as possible that you can do so much to protect yourself and to protect your loved ones. This means being informed knowing where the virus is, where you live, you know, holding your uh, leaders accountable to help understand where this virus is circulating and what you need to do. Follow the guidance that is put in place in your local area of what to do. Make sure that you uh, perform hand hygiene. Wash your hands, carry your, um, your alcohol-based rub, make sure that you have this with you. It's practice respiratory etiquette. It's wearing a mask, making sure that you wear a mask in the most appropriate settings, particularly can you, where you cannot do physical distancing when you're in enclosed spaces. It means avoiding enclosed spaces. It means improving ventilation, opening your window, for example. It means looking after your mental health, you know, making sure that you do something every day that makes you happy, you look in on loved ones. There's so much that you can do. And it means to know your risk. Take a risk-based approach every day when you leave your house, when you're on your way to work. What are the things that I can do to reduce my exposure, to reduce my risk of infection? And have a plan. Talk to your family about this. Talk to your kids about this. Talk to your loved ones and your extended family about what do I need to do? If I think I'm infected, what does that mean in my area? Who do I call? I had an experience with my own son of saying, oh, he had a sore throat when he came home from school. What were the first things that I needed to do to make sure that he got a test? What does that mean in your household? And what do you need to do? And if you don't know, figure it out now. So I'm sorry, I just want to make it very clear that even though it was a very sciencey one today and we were quite technical, but the audience needs to feel empowered and be empowered to take actions to protect themselves. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We just need to explain as well, we are not wearing masks here because we are physically distant and we are sitting in the room which has good ventilation. We recommend wearing masks if you're in crowded, closed spaces with poor, poor ventilation. And the last question I want to ask because we're talking a lot about what we've learned and the question came actually from our Facebook viewer and I think it's a great one to close with. What, did you, what have you two learned, what's the biggest thing you two learned through this pandemic? Not on it doesn't have to be on diagnostic in tests, but what have you learned working on this response? There aren't enough hours in the day. I know, my <laughs> goodness. We just need to, that's what we, yeah. I think humility, I think the, the Tedros talks about that. Uh, we all think we know everything until we're faced with the reality of knowing nothing <laughs> and then starting again. So um, I think humility in the face of a threat this big um, and, and the courage to to get up every morning and do what you can about it and uh, sometimes that's the the most important thing you do and, and everyone has to do that in their lives right now so yeah I wouldn't yeah there's lots of sciencey things we could say about the future and everything else but for all of us uh, that and just also to, uh, I've learned that people we focus on the bad information and the bad people and the people who do bad things and who don't do things right but actually I I, what I've learned from this is that people are really smart, people are, people are inherently good, um, and people want to do the right thing, um, but sometimes they're not empowered to do that, um, they're not given the resources to make that happen, um, and uh, you know, we're going to have to address some of these systematic inequities in our society, we're going to have to address some of these existential issues that we face because this pandemic is just really a warning shot around how we're managing the planet, how we're managing our societies. So I do think the lesson I've learned is uh, this might be just the first lesson and we need to start learning very, very quickly. Maria? I think that the answer of humility is important. I mean, we try a lot to talk about what we know and what we don't know and and importantly, what we're doing to find out. Um, and I think having, I feel grateful that we have such a system in place that we are 
literally able to harness the world's expertise. I mean, WHO's convening power, convening ability of people working with us to help advance our knowledge on this is, is really quite incredible. And the other thing is, is the leadership. You know, if you have strong leadership, if you have clear messaging around what someone needs to do, then you have an entire global population that's with you in this fight. And when you don't have that, you have that division. And so Dr. Tedros talks about that all the time, solidarity, science, solutions, and viruses like this find fractures, and they find ways to break those, to, to make those fractures even, even more prominent. Um, and that should not be underestimated. We are scientists, you know, we are public health professionals, but every outbreak that we are involved in, the science becomes smaller and smaller and the politics become bigger and bigger. And if anyone has ever heard me give a presentation, I say that in every single one of my presentations. So that's not something new, but I think that that ability to be able to work across all of the different sectors should not be underestimated and has not been underestimated. But I think we're all kind of seeing that. So that unity that we have to fight this together makes us so much stronger. And we are smarter than this virus. And we have the tools in place to bring this under control. We just need to collectively come together to, to apply that. Thank you very much for your time and for this great conversation. Please. Because uh, um, uh, I think the Time 100 list uh, yes. came out today, and yes. we're very proud to see uh, Dr. Tedros' name there. But I think more importantly, in many ways, there, there are two others or a few others named there. Uh, we see Tony Fauci mm -hmm. named there. Uh, we see Jean-Jacques Moyembe, mm -hmm. Professor Jean-Jacques, who's been the, f the father of the fight against Ebola for 40 years. Yes. Um, an amazing person. But also a person called Amy O'Sullivan, a frontline worker in New York. Uh, fantastic, great photo actually in time. Uh, and I think that's a real, I mean, we can argue over the list and I'm sure many people are already tweeting their objections to this hundred, but that one is really important because that speaks to health workers and frontline workers all over the world. And uh, So I think it's great to see those kinds of heroes, uh, especially Jean-Jacques and, 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 and Amy, because they make the difference. And, uh, it's just nice to see a list having people like that on it. So mm -hmm. just thought I'd say that before we break it, up. It is really impressive. And I would use this opportunity saying thank you to you two for this great conversation. Thanks to our health heroes who are recognized, but also to all of those health heroes, health workers on front lines. Uh, also, we talked about testing and diagnostics, all those lab technicians, supply, um, transport workers, um, researchers, manufacturers, donors, everyone who helped us actually and who keeps helping us to, to respond to this outbreak and to save lives. Um, until next Wednesday, uh, follow our social media channel, website, and um, join us for, for new session next Wednesday. Thank you.